This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. Um, so in the last lecture, we uh, discussed uh, um, two um, type of one-dimensional conduction. Uh, one is a simple case where the uh, dimension is through a plane wall, and the other is through a um, cylinder. So this is uh, um, both are pretty, pretty um, straightforward, and uh, that's because we simplify the general heat conduction equation um, almost as much as we uh, we can. So particularly, we do not consider any uh, y and z direction. Of, uh, of the uh, of the conduction, we do not consider any generate heat generation or transient uh, um, phenomena. So um, that's uh, the major part of the conduction, one-dimensional conduction. The other concept uh, that we want to have, the other concept that we want to have. Uh, um, is called the uh, contact resistance. So that's something related uh, to the one one D conduction. So this one is saying that uh, um, often you want to put the different materials together, uh, and uh, uh, the conduction can happening through. Um, a certain device, a certain components, which is, which has cert several materials being uh, put together. For example, um, so today, if you look, uh, if you do some cooking at home, if you're looking at the base of the um, cookware, <coughs> or the uh, either the either the pan or the or the um, cooking pot, often it's uh, um, pretty thick. So that's called the um, Composite base, composite base. So there actually there are several different type of materials being put together to enhance the heat transfer because the heat is always coming from the bottom, right? So for example, if you have a, um, some kind of pot, and then at the bottom, often you have some good conductor being put at the bottom. For example, that can be copper or aluminum. So we know they have a, a very um, high K value. And often, you do, you do not directly see copper um, there because um, for looking and for um, anti-rusting, Often you put another layer of stainless steel at the bottom. Right. So you don't directly see those um, high conducting material, but uh, but from the thickness you can tell that it's not just uh, one material. There is several material being put together. So that's actually called uh, um, it's done by a process called. Um, cladding.
and often uh, in the inner side you also have a layer of stainless steel so that uh, um, from looking it's all stainless steel. <coughs> um, so for this type of problem basically you have the heat coming from the bottom and then needs to conduct through uh, several layers of material uh, which are being put together. And uh, if you measure the um, thermal resistance across it, for example, if I draw a case like this, just in a horizontal way, you have A here, you have B there, you have the heat conducting through it, right? So often you find that the thermal resistance of the total, which is supposed to be the sum of the A and the B, but often not. Often the total resistance is larger than the sum of these two. <clears throat> Consider that A and B generally is a pretty good conductor. But you have certain um, factor or certain things happening there which is giving you a larger resistance that you, um, you would prefer. So that's mainly because the contact surface, if you zoom in there, that's never 100% uh, flat. So if you zoom in there into the interface, so if I draw a um, zoomed in view of it, so you have A on this side, I really zoomed in uh, in the using a amplifier, something like that. And then uh, the other side you have B. So that's A, that's B. That's the reality in terms of in the microscopic uh, level. So there you have certain, um, it's called a void, basically the material is not uh, um, all contact with each other, so you have certain space, certain void there, and uh, in general that's air, right? Unless it's uh, emerged in um, really underneath the water and it may be filled with, with, with water or other things, but in general it's air. And we know air has a much smaller K uh, thermal conductivity compared to metal, right? So because of air existing between the uh, this actual surface, what you actually have in terms of uh, temperature distribution, if I have X there, and uh, if I using the other one as the gap to approximate the gap there, you would have uh, very little temperature drop there huge temperature drop there, and then a very little temperature drop there. So if that's A and a B. <clears throat> so this little gap, uh, just because it's uh, you got some low conductivity material in the middle, uh, in between, can greatly enhance your, uh, greatly reduce your, um, reduce the temperature um, in, uh, increase the temperature difference between these two. So if you consider everything is uh, ideal, then you would have a line just like this, right? If A and B have a similar, have, 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 have similar K value. And we said that the temperature drop corresponding to, temperature drop corresponding to thermal resistance. So if I have Q going this direction, delta T is proportional to the thermal resistance. <clears throat> Particularly, if the um, if the two material is not being properly put together. So, in general, for this um, for this commercial product, there there has been uh, um, properly properly manufactured, and uh, their thermal resistance wouldn't be huge. But if you uh, if uh, if something being put together by some non-professional people, uh, you can have a large temperature drop um, at the condition where we would not want it to happen. <clears throat> All right, so for th this type of uh, um, thermal resistance, you can uh, approximate into 
Um, for example, it's a two resistance in parallel. So one is you can simplify or you can estimate the contact area, actual contact area at the interface. So that's so still the resistance uh, between A and B due to the uh, a and the B both contribute uh, um, to some surface area there. And the other one is due to the, let's say, it's a fluid um, in the void, which is air. So these two resistance being put together in parallel, forming the um, contact resistance there. <clears throat> and certainly, um, um, in many cases, you want to avoid this to happen. And to avoid this happen, you can do a few things. So to reduce So one thing is uh, um, you can do surface polishing, make the surface as smooth as possible. And uh, um, you can apply pressure uh, when the material is being put together. Right? So basically to squeeze the, um, the air um, out of the interface. So that's called contact pressure. or increase contact pressure. And the other one is if you can um, fill this um, gap or void with some high conducting material, for example, if they are really accessible, you can um, put in some um, solder, and you melt the solder, and the solder can, uh, uh, can flow into this void, then that will, that will um, replace the Conductivity via air um, through um, to the uh, to the um, to the uh, metal. So the few avoid high K material. All right, so that's the um, the, the things uh, that you want to be aware of related to conduction. So, um, because when two material being put together, their total resistance is not necessarily simply the sum of these two. And you need really need to take care of how the interface being uh, put together. And then uh, you want, actually, if you want to enhance the heat transfer, basically you want to um, reduce that res contact resistance as much as you can. All right, so that's um, the 1D conduction part. So the next topic we are going to, um, yeah. So Yes, so um, if I draw it, um, like uh, in a more illustrative way. So what you have in here is, uh, for example, you have A, or you have material A on this side, you have material B on this side, all right? And you can, I mean, this is an approximation. So you can simplify this, um, the gap into two components, one is, saying that they have reduced the um, area um, getting into each other, right, compared to a, a, um, a, a truly flat surface. So there you would have a certain area, and that area you can consider is partially contributed by A and partially contributed by B. So how much it is, is really you need to measure. It's not something you can theoretically uh, determine. And then uh, you have another one, which is basically the void there. So you have uh, what I refer to by AB a, is indeed uh, the sum of these two, but uh, each material contributes uh, part of it. 
and then this void uh, is, uh, is another resistance and uh, being put together with this in, in parallel. Right? Um, so the next uh, topic we are going to discuss in the um, conduction chapter is called uh, Extended Surface the conduction <clears throat> so this is a, um, a common type of uh, approach used to enhance the conduction so as I said conduction is one mode uh, of heat transfer par uh, uh, comparable to heat convection and radiation right so if we want to enhance the uh, heat conduction that's the common way that you use. So the purpose of extended surface is to enhance heat transfer. So that's something you want to be aware. It's not to. Uh, it's not for insulation purpose. It's want to um, get rid of um, more heat, right? And uh, and the idea is, we know that uh, uh, when we write all the um, heat transfer equations for all these three modes. The Q is proportional to different parameters, but one common parameter is proportional to is area. If you're looking at the rate equation we um, briefly introduced uh, earlier on, so they're all related to the um, area. Area, which is area available for the heat transfer to happen. So extended surface and heat conduction, basically, if we can increase or, or, or make more surface area available, then the um, heat will, um, we can enhance the heat transfer rate. All right. So there is many applications, um, which is, uh, have utilized uh, this type of uh, concept. <clears throat> it runs related to the cooling of combustion engine. So combustion engine constantly needs cooling. Um, that's mainly because the combustion happening at a very high temperature, typically around 2,000 Kelvin, and not many metal, or if any metal, can handle that high temperature, right? So the engine constantly needs cooling, and the cooling can be achieved in two ways. One is called air cooled, so basically using air to cool the um, engine. And in order to do that, you're using, uh, for the motorcycle, you're using the so-called air-cooled um, engine. So this air-cooled engine, um, which is different from the water-cooled engine, which we're going to show you in a minute. So this type of engine, um, you're just using fin. So basically, when the motorcycle is uh, running at a, at a certain speed, then the air will come in, and, uh, and uh, then through this fin structure this type of extended surface, then the heat transfer will be sufficient to cool the engine. All right. So that's for the relatively small engine, which is used for motorcycle. For a large can engine like a car, you, uh, that air-cooled engine generally is insufficient, so you would be using water-cooled uh, engine. So this one actually is not the device directly cool the engine. So this is a radiator. So you have the coolant, which is running Basically, the engine has a water jacket or coolant jacket and surrounding the engine cylinder. And those, when those coolant are being uh, heated up, going through the engine, those heat needs to be dumped. So the coolant needs to be cooled. Right? So this is a radiator is a device to cool the coolant. Then the, when the coolant is cooled, then going, going back to, um, to, the, to the coolant jacket to, to cool the engine. So this one is, is a water-cooled uh, and if you're looking at it, there is many uh, tiny things uh, installed there. And the coolant is going from one side. Uh, or the water is going from one side, and then the coolant are going from the other side. <clears throat> and if you uh, are looking at the, if you go to the refrigeration lab, uh, and uh, there is this type of structure, which is, uh, used uh, to um, to cool the evaporator. 
so which is at the bottom of the of the unit there. All right, so um, here actually the surface um, because have many tiny things. The sur surface area actually is uh, much larger compared to the case without thing. Another application of this um, extended surface is um, so inside the computer. So this is a desktop <coughs> computer. And uh, there are certain components on the motherboard that uh, generate a lot more heat uh, than the rest. For example, CPU, or for example, the um, video card. So they require some special measure in order to cool them. So this one basically is a thing-like structure, which is there, which is sitting right on top of the CPU. And then uh, the heat will be conducted through these things. And then you have a fan there to um, generate some forced convection and to further um, to further cool the um, CPU. And here is another structure which is a, uh, which is smaller but uh, but uh, using the similar um, idea in terms of um, cooling. The the thing can uh, come in with different type of uh, geometry. Um, so what I'm showing here is that it's just different type of geometry that can be used to um, design a thin type of structure. It can be a, a uniform a cross section area, rectangular, can be a triangle, and it can be circular, and it can be a cone type. So that's uh, all can be used depending you know, depending on your application. So what I'm going to um, for our study. We will pick up a um, pretty simple case, and uh, then we want to analyze the energy balance and analyze how a thing can be used or what's the heat transfer rate can be can happen uh, from one one thing. So we are not talking about many things together. We're just talking a single thing um, for our discussion. All right. So if we draw a a single thing which is installed on a, um, on a wall, it's a um, rectangular thing. <clears throat> Just uh, um, Sticking out of the um, surface, All right? Um, <clears throat> so let's define a few um, geometry of this uh, this piece. So the lens we call it L. Um, the width and the thickness. <clears throat> right. So for the thing, um, the parameter we evaluate uh, the thing is how much heat it can it can dissipate from the base. So that's one we call the Q zero. That's a heat that is being conducted through the base, and then uh, later on um, either transferred, dumped to the air, or or um, or transferred along the thin lens, right? So we have the um, convection happening because it's exposed either to air or water or, or liquid. So let's see T infinity and uh, um, heat transfer coefficient. So I should uh, uh, mention that the con the thin heat transfer always involving um, convection. So it's not a, it's always a multi-mode that are involving conduction and the convection, right? <clears throat> so we want to um, the purpose of our an uh, analysis is to find out 
the Q0. So with a given thing, what is the heat it can dissipate, right? So that's one thing. And also we want to find out uh, the temperature um, distribution, or Tx. So if we call, this is 0, base at 0, and then uh, um, the length is x. <clears throat> we want to find out what's the temperature distribution along the uh, uh, thin lens. Right. So this is uh, uh, the setting of a problem. And uh, um, the approach here is similar to the way we um, derive the heat conduction equation. So a couple of lectures ago. Um, we want to know a temperature distribution in a conducting medium, right? So we need to apply our first principle. And to apply our first principle, which is energy balance, we need to choose the object that we apply it, right? And here, similar to what we did there, we choose a, a thin slice of this conducting medium and apply the energy balance there. So our control volume is a slice of this thing. And we choose <coughs> that as our control body. So that's of dx. All right, so if I write the uh, if I write a larger, draw a larger picture of it. So that's dx, and uh, we needed to apply our energy balance, the general one, E in plus E gen equals to E out plus any change. Right, so let's assume we have a, a, a steady problem, and we have a no generation problem. The, the the thing is conducting heat. The thing itself does not uh, generating heat. Right. So um, here, the inlet or the incoming uh, incoming energy flow. Would including the heat that is conducted from the if if I consider this is x right coming from the base direction, the direction from the base. So for the differential um, location, where I would say the q x that's coming by conduction, and then a certain limit will be the conduction term going up. Right, and uh, any other energy terms here? Are we dealing with conduction only? Yeah, as we said, uh, this thing problem always involving convection, and the convection is happening on the surface, right? So the convection is taking away heat. And the convection happens um, for this setup happens both at the top surface, bottom surface, as well as the sides, right? So any surface area, any surface that exposed to the um, cooling air or cooler air, then uh, it will have convection to happen. So it will happens in a uh, multiple direction. But I just write one term there. All right. So that's important thing to remember. Analyze your um, control body, apply the energy balance, which means you need to identify all the source or sinks of your energy, right, for your energy equation. So if you miss any term, then certainly you wouldn't get it right. <clears throat> All right, so then uh, that's simple. The Qx, that's the source, and the uh, sink would be x plus dx plus the Q compact, <clears throat> right? And so 
you want to appreciate it to get um, this equation right, that's, uh, that's critical. And that's requiring you first uh, to know this equation. I mean, this is the equation uh, later on you, you, will be, you, you will be very familiar with. But analyzing your problem in terms of the um, energy flow. All right. So then uh, um, it's, uh, what left, uh, it's uh, just uh, the bringing the equations to express this um, uh, heat transfer term. The Qx is the conduction. I said, let's, let's deal with heat flux. Then uh, times uh, area. And this area is for conduction to happen, that's this cross section area of the thing, right? So if I call it as AC, as a cross section area, and I have the x plus dx flux, also as AC. And I have the convection. Convection happens in uh, a different surface. That's important to recognize. Convection happens on the exposed uh, surface to the air. So that one is, is, can be expressed by a product of two terms. One is the parameter of the thing. So if I consider the two times of T plus two times of W, will give the oh, parameter, parameter, parameter of the thing, and then at times the dx, that will give me the um, the differential um, surface area of this problem. Right. So this one is the parameter. which is 2w plus t, right? So basically, for a given thing, there's a known value. All right, so what I'm going to do um, next is uh, um, I will rearrange the term and divide all terms by ac dx. So divide all by ac dx. I'm actually following certain routine, uh, if you see it uh, um, um, enough. So I'm doing, everything I'm doing here actually is pretty routine. This is already the second or third time I'm doing this. So you have this different uh, energy term expressed, then I divide A dx. So I move this um, Q plus dx term to the other side. Then I, I have the Q x plus dx minus qx divided by dx, right? And then I have a, um, I have a p a c uh, q convect, <clears throat> right? What is this term? Can I rewrite this term? <coughs> DQ, DQ uh, flux dx. Yeah? So that's the one we see the, um, the third time. So that will be D, sorry, Q, X, dx. So based on the definition, how a differential can be um, defined. So a small change of your function versus a small change of your variable, and uh, when the small change is approaching zero, then you will have this um, um, equation. And then uh, I have the P A C Q C O V convection. All right? So to this point, uh, I'm just uh, applying the first law and uh, um, a, a few mathematical um, tricks here, All right? So next step, step is the another important step in the routine, which is bringing the uh, rate equation, the heat transfer equation for the different modes here. So 
and bring in and Fourier law and uh, um, Newton's law of cooling. So basically, it's to um, bring the rate equation. All right. So then I have the dx, the heat flux of the for the um, conduction will be k dt dx. So I got cancelled with the uh, um, two minus sign, and then I have the p a c, and for convection, I have the h. Um, T minus T infinity. <clears throat> All right, this is the temperature um, on the thin surface, and this is ambient temperature, and uh, this uh, that one is the temperature gradient um, along the along the um, thin lines. All right, so if I consider K is a constant. Then I can sim further simplify equals to P H P K A C T minus T infinity. <clears throat> right. So um, to solve this uh, equation, I just uh, have uh, um, defined the two um, parameters. First, I define the temperature difference between the thin surface temperature and the ambient as theta. So theta equals T minus T infinity. Right? And then I define this term, HPKAC term, as M square. So I, I know it's a um, every parameter here is should be positive, so I can define a positive. Uh, I can define m square uh, there. So then uh, I uh, I got the d square theta dx square, right? So that's no problem. And then m square theta. So this is a simple second order uh, homogeneous differential equation, right? So there is a standard um, solution for this type of equation, which I'm not going to, I'm not going to um, prove that, but just to give you the um, solution. So the theta should be equals to C1 E minus mx plus C2 E mx. <clears throat> All right, so um, by definition, we have the second order differential. When we integrate twice, we will have two um, constants there. Yeah. Two constants means to solve these two constants, which means we need a two we need a two conditions, right? Two boundary conditions, as we seen uh, for the one D conduction problem. So two boundary conditions. So one is when x equals to zero. I say that temperature is known. T equals to T zero, which means theta equals to T zero minus T infinity. That equals to theta zero, right? <clears throat> so that's one, and uh, that's at the thin base. And the other one is at the thin tip. X equals to air. <clears throat> x equals to air. Um, we need to use, there is generally four type of boundary conditions at the thin tip, and uh, we need to choose one of them to, to use. So I, I'm going to introduce that uh, um, in a minute. So one of the four tip conditions. So one um, tip condition is 
um, the so-called uh, um, infinite, infinitely long thing. So the the thing is, is a uh, length is infinite. So in this case, you can <coughs> you can imagine if the thing is infinitely long at the end of the um, the length, the temperature would be same as the ambient, right? So if it's not uh, the same, then uh, I can get, I can um, make the thing even longer until it becomes the same temperature, right? So that temperature TL equals to infinity, which means the theta L that equals to zero. So that's one extreme case. Uh, the other case called the um, adiabatic tip So this case <clears throat> is saying you have a condition where the heat transfer at the tip that is equals to equals to zero. So you can convert it to be dx, uh, dt dx, or at L equals to d theta dx at L that equals to zero. So let's consider the um, adiabatic uh, tip. No heat transfer. And the third one is called a convective tip. This is a more of the common condition. Consider that uh, at the tip, right, you have the Q conduct to that uh, um, tip surface, that the vertical surface, and uh, all those heat is taken away by the convection. <clears throat> so if these two are equal, then uh, you have so-called convective tip. So you have the Q conduct equals to Q convect at uh, X equals to L. So you can apply the energy balance just based on that. You have the minus K A C D T dx X equals to L. Then you have the um, H A T L minus T infinity. <clears throat> so this area um, for this case, this convection heat transfer area is actually this um, tip surface, right? Which is a cross section area of this tip. So in this case, that's also A C. So basically, you can cancel. Uh, um, cancel that too. You can get a uh, um, um, temperature gradient at the tip, um, as the, as a part of your, uh, as one of your boundary conditions there. And the last one is uh, um, is uh, just a setting. It's a uh, um, prescribed uh, tip. So that one is saying that uh, you know the temperature there. So the T L at uh, x equals to L, so the theta L equals to T L minus T infinity. <clears throat> right. So you choose, depending on what the problem asking you, you choose one of these um, tip conditions um, as your second boundary condition, then combine with your base uh, boundary condition, then you can solve the problem. And the solution Solution is already being done, and uh, I don't need to um, derive them uh, or repeat them. So basically, it's showing in this table, which is included in the lecture notes. <clears throat> so this one consider, again, the infinite law case. Then you um, have the solution, which is a, is a temperature distribution, and the thing heat transfer. This one is QF, but that equals to Q zero. That in our uh, in our um, notation. So this is the total amount of heat that are being uh, that are leaving the base of the of the thing. Um, so there you can find that the, the solution already being um, tabulated for the different uh, um, tip condition, and here um, just the M is the same M that we defined, and the capital. Letter M is a, is a, another term. So that's all um, 
that's all um, clear. And then uh, you have the uh, adiabatic case, which is the solution is a little bit more complicated uh, than there. And then the convective tip is even more complicated. And then prescribed uh, um, tip is also there. So the, uh, here is a hyperbolic, uh, hyperbolic functions, the sine, cosine uh, equation, which, uh, um, which has its own which has its own definition, which you can find uh, um, if you are not familiar with it. <clears throat> so that's basically is uh, done based on the an analysis that the, um, the the heat transfer analysis we apply to the thing, and uh, based on the differential equation we obtained, and based on the boundary condition that we discussed. So choosing one of them will directly give you the give you the solution of the problem, right? So that um, should be um, um, straightforward. Just a few uh, words um, about the different types. So one uh, thing we can, uh, uh, or you might wonder, is uh, um, how long is infinitely long? So we call it infinitely long, and how um, um, until what length or beyond what length we can consider this thing is um, infinitely long. So that's the things we can have a discussion. So um, this discussion consider that uh, um, Consider that uh, the infinitely long um, tip is a special case of adiabatic uh, um, tip. So if you consider that, if you have infinitely long tip, at the end of the um, length, the tip temperature will be same as the ambient temperature, right? Which means the heat transfer must be zero there. So that's saying that uh, the infinitely long tip is a special case of the adiabatic uh, tip. So that's an uh, understanding we want to have. Then the uh, consideration is, if it's a special case, then uh, <clears throat> if I have an adiabatic uh, um, tip, um, for a thing of a certain length, if uh, if that thing can can uh, transfer, for example, ninety nine percent of the heat equivalent to a um, infinitely long tip, then I consider that uh, the length of my adiabatic uh, the thing with adiabatic tip is infinitely long. Right. So if I have an adiabatic tip, which is certainly not infinitely long of certain length, but if this tip can conduct 99% of the heat for an infinitely long case, then I can consider that length to be infinitely long, effectively. All right? So that is saying that the heat, the heat transfer by an adiabatic tip equals to 99% of the heat transfer of uh, infinite. Because this one has no length, infinitely long, and this one has a length, then I can figure out, I can say this length is infinitely long, effectively. All right? So then we were looking at the equation, the solution that we got already. <clears throat> so infinitely long and uh, uh, looking at the heat transfer, all right? So the difference between them is only um, um, tangential hyperbolic function. So that's just the, so this one saying that if we have the tangential hyperbolic of ML equals to 0.99, then uh, <clears throat> my adiabatic tip can transfer effectively the same amount of heat as a infinite tip, infinite thing, right? So, so this is an equation you can easily find where the ML should equal to 
So m again is a is a function that we defined earlier. So that's that's that one, which for a given thing or can a given ambient condition, that's a value you know. And then uh, based on this equation, you can back out what's the length there. All right. So that's that's a, uh, that's the idea. And the other one uh, is about uh, we can again um, utilize the adiabatic tip and uh, considering we can convert a um, convective tip to an adiabatic tip. And the idea here again is related to if you're looking at the solution for adiabatic tip, so it's this two, which is much simpler compared to a convective tip case. So if we can convert a convective tip to be an adiabatic tip, then we can deal with a simpler problem. So that's um, next thing we can discuss. So the idea here is also pretty um, straightforward. For example, if this is your convective tip, so <clears throat> at uh, at the end uh, we said the heat transfer is basically the conduction equals to convection on this surface, right? So if we convert this surface area to a lens. So if I make this, if I make this um, tip slightly longer, and I have the area of the extended uh, slightly longer <coughs> um, thing, it has a like a longer surface area, right? If I make this area equals to that area, and treat this as the adiabatic tip, then I didn't change the problem um, essentially, right? So there is no heat transfer on this surface, but uh, with a little bit of longer area, a, a little bit longer length. So if I this one has the um, area and the, this area are equal, which, which means this one is equals to um, equals to delta x, which is additional additional length, I guess, yeah, delta x times the parameter of the thing, which is uh, 2 times w plus t. And that one is equals to the um, the thing AC cross section area, which is uh, W times T. All right. Um, I think that's uh, all for today, and uh, we can continue uh, Tuesday. So the assignment is due uh, Monday. All right. Second problem. Oh, can we talk outside?
Yeah. Here, I think uh, uh, the next one's coming. Yeah. I think the picture of the last one.